as I take a moment to thank a pastor for giving me this opportunity to bring the word today. I just want to ask you to settle in. I'm about to read a big chunk of scripture. So if you would just be patient with me, here we go. It'll be on your screen, but I, I don't want you to rush me because I feel like it'll be important. Our thoughts this morning. Thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity. Body of Christ, hear the word of God. Coming from John chapter four, a uh, handful of verses. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and, and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, which is about noon. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Verse eight, his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, and as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, speaking of the water and the well. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying you have no husband, for you have had five husbands and the one that you are with now is not your husband. What you've said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to a woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father is seeking such people to worship him. God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the townspeople, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has someone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do not say yet there is four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here, the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many have labored and you have 
entered into the labor, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there a couple of days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that caused us to believe. For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. Wow, what a reading. May God bless the reading and the patient hearers of his holy word. Will you pray with me as we anchor our thoughts in the subject? You're going the wrong way. And we're gonna take that thought from a few of the verses that we just read. Pray with me. God, we're here and we're listening. We're here and we're listening. So speak for your glory, for our good. Speak for Christ's sake, amen. You've heard me share before, and I'll do it again because I just feel like it's fitting for this moment. You're going the wrong way. The Mississippi River is in North America, the second largest, second longest river. It spans approximately 2,400 miles. It flows from the north to the south, beginning at a glacial lake up in Minnesota, up in Minnesota, and makes its trek all the way down south to Louisiana and dumps, empties itself into the Gulf of Mexico. But in 2012, the usual current, the usual normal flow of the Mississippi from Minnesota to Louisiana, something phenomenal happened in 2012. We had a hurricane, Hurricane Isaac, and the United States Geological Survey and the Army Corps of Engineers reported that strong winds and storm surge caused this juggernaut of a river that normally flows from north to south to do something amazing. For 24 hours, the Mississippi River flowed backwards from Louisiana back up towards Minnesota. I can just imagine in my mind that if the scientists and, 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 and the engineers of that day could do river speak, maybe had river language, they would say to the Mississippi River, hey, hey, I, I think you're going the wrong way. It was clear to them that the direction was off. It was obvious that the path of the river, the flow, the current was wrong. In the same way, here in John chapter four, Jesus did something that some believers, might say was mm, a bit off course. Some believers might tell him, Jesus, you're going the wrong way. And that brings us to our second point. You're going, what in the world, second point? You haven't covered the first. We're picking up from last week. The point last week that we looked at when we were thinking about it, I think last week the series title was What's wrong with the right way? I've kind of changed it. So this is the new title for the series. You're going the wrong way. Last week's point was the Christian call to be a reconciler. And we looked at how Jesus um, being a Jew, Jesus being a man, a prophet, went into Samaria, a place that for all intents and purposes, for the culture of that day, he was not supposed to be going to Samaria. And yet he went there to reconcile. He went there to redeem. He went there to restore some things lost and broken and disconnected. So many things he was not supposed to do, he did. And we looked at 
how maybe the disciples would have said to Jesus because he had said in his word, I want you to go uh, uh, to the house of Israel. I don't want you to go to the Gentiles. In fact, he specifically said, I don't want you to go to Samaritans, none of their towns. And yet here he was in their mind going the wrong way. So last week's thought and point was um, the Christian call to be a reconciler. And this week, we're going to look at the Christian's call to be transparent, the Christian's call to be vulnerable, the Christian's call to be honest, all one and the same. So the thing that is not to be missed here, you, you got to come with me on this one simple observation, lest my, my teaching might fall apart. Jesus is going to Samaria was a work of ministry. Jesus' going to Samaria was not to go to a wedding, was not to go to some kickback, a get together, was not to visit. No, Jesus said, remember we talked about it last week, that Greek word dia in the original, that D-I-A, that must, needs. The King James expressed it best when he says, he must, needs. It was a double whammy. He, he didn't say, I must go, I need to go. He must needs go to Samaria. So here is kind of the underpinnings of what I want us to build on today. His going to Samaria was a work of ministry, that ministerial work and that evangelistic work landed him in Samaria at that well, tired, fatigued, sitting, weary and thirsty. Look at verse six, Jesus, weary as he was from his journey was found in Samaria, sitting at the well in the noontime. Now we're going to build from that Point number two, the Christians call to be transparent and vulnerable and honest. And I want to tell you, and don't, don't get mad at me, I, I'm, I hope to qualify this a lot later. There are some well-meaning believers who have an elevated view of the deity of Jesus. And they might find this verse, this teaching uh, to be somewhat unsettling. They might not be very fond of this teaching. They may say, Jesus, you're, you're going the wrong way. You know, like telling people that you're tired and telling people that, that you need rest, revealing that your body is fatigued. You're, you're going the wrong way in being honest about you have this, this, this desire for you to be replenished and to be refreshed. Think about it, Jesus, you know, you're, you're God and you're showing this weakness. But I'm glad that we have this verse in scripture along with other verses like Hebrews 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted, he's been tested in every way imaginable, just as we have been, just as we are, yet without sin. So again, some people fall off of the horse on the side of Jesus being God and they miss his humanity. And by extension, by default, what they do is they crush the faults and the failings of his followers. You mean to tell me those of you who lead, those of you who he's called to be church leaders, you're supposed to be super pastors, right? And, and you, you men of God who are married, you're supposed to be super husbands. And, and ladies, you don't get a pass. Super women of God. Jesus, tired, Christians, weak. You're not supposed to cry. You're not supposed to make mistakes. You're not supposed to be broke. You're not supposed to sin. Your marriages aren't supposed to fail. 
Your children aren't supposed to be gay, bisexual. I say no, not so. Christians must declare to an onlooking world that we serve a God who has super strength and is able, if need be, to carry us. But we still show the world our feet. We tell the world we are but dust. And we are not afraid to expose our sandals. All of our worn and beat up and dusty sandals. All of the tears in our sandals, all of the scars on our feet. And we say to them, I, just like you, I bleed, I cry, I get lonely, and I'm not ashamed, and nor am I embarrassed to confess that I get scared, I get tired, I get angry. So no, like Jesus, I'm, I'm not going the wrong way. And body of Christ, I encourage you, you don't have to be better than you are. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to be bigger than you are in this moment if this moment is where he has you. There was a college recruiter who was recruiting a star high school athlete. And he was interviewing this athlete and, 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 and said to him, hey, son, I hear you're pretty good. And the kid said, I'm the best there ever was. I average 45 points a game. I lead my team in steals, lead my team in block shots. I was the best rebounder on my team. I, we went with three undefeated seasons, and I led us to three state championships. The recruiter said, wow, that's impressive. Why, why don't you tell me? Tell me, do you have any weaknesses? The young kid responded sheepishly. Well, I do have a tendency to exaggerate. <laughs> we are absolutely right, body of Christ, to magnify all of the glorious things, all of the unbelievable things, all of the inimitable things about Jesus, what he did, what he said. But remember, before the multitudes received him, he was rejected in his own hometown. Before he raised Lazarus from the grave, he wept like a baby. Before the temple was turned into a marketplace, he angrily turned over tables. And before he was beaten and murdered at Calvary, he begged his daddy for his life. Yes, with his humanity on full display. Jesus showed you and me. It's all right to be transparent. It's all right to be emotional. It's all right to be human. And then Paul would come along later and underscored for us in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. I will boast. I will brag. Oh my goodness. You get me on a good day. I can, well, I can brag about some good stuff about Heck, you get me on a bad day, I'll brag about good stuff about me. But Paul said, I will boast all the more gladness, all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content. I'm okay with being weak. I'm okay with insults and hardships and persecutions and calamities for when I am weak, then I am strong. So that's the crux of the point that I want to make. Maybe those of you who are pastor, Pastor Hamilton, for you, maybe this is word for you today so that you don't need to be crushed under the weight of is my ministry big enough? Is my church big enough? Is the offering this Sunday big enough? Maybe you, believer, you need to hear this so that you won't be crushed under the weight of, is my gift big enough? Is my marriage good enough? I'm afraid to expose the weak layers of my family, my job, my education. That's the crux of the message. However, I feel like 
and I felt it strongly this morning. Wow, it feels like there's so much that needs to be qualified, that needs to be fixed. I'm not going to try to fix it. If I erred in giving you God's word, I'm not going to apologize for that. But I do believe as a teacher, I owe it to you to maybe qualify and look at and further examine some things within this text to give us a greater and better understanding of it. I'm going to look at three qualifiers, three quick, quick qualifiers, three quick thoughts. The first two, and, and don't be mad at me, Tammy, but the first two are going to be tethered to last week. So I pray that you either remember or you're able to go back. Remember now, Jesus as a reconciler. And what he showed us and told us was what it means for us, the Christian, to be called to reconcile. And the first two quick points that I want to look at still tied to this honesty, this transparency, this vulnerability, this honesty. Those first two that I'm going to look at, the first two, are going to be tied to reconciliation. And I think the third one kind of stands on its own. So the first encouragement, first qualifier, the first extension of this thought would be, don't be hypocritical, excuse me, don't be hypocritical. And remember, I said it's still tied in some ways to reconciliation. When we tie honesty and reconciliation, Jesus shows us something interesting, something that we cannot miss. Because Jesus in his humanity he entered into this ministry of reconciliation in his humanity, but he did it without sin. Remember, we just looked at it in Hebrews chapter four. He did it without sin. But we can be funny in our approach to reconciliation. We could be funny in our dealing with people that we don't like because we could be biased and we could be self-serving if we're not transparent and vulnerable and honest. Now you say, where are you going with this thought? Now, listen, don't be hypocritical. Let's look at where I'm going, what I'm thinking about. Verse nine, from the big reading that we just went through, verse nine said, the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. I read that and it's good information. I read that because I've, I've said that ton of times when I'm teaching about Jews and Samaritans, about the intermingling, the intermarriage, and how the Samaritans built a temple, and they were bitter enemies, and they wouldn't go to Samaria. Blah, blah, blah. Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. And then I read verse 8, and it said that the disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Do you see it? Because if I were a Samaritan in Sikar, I'd say, if I can't come to your house to eat my bread, then I ain't selling you my bread. You don't get to choose to not deal with me in one capacity and then deal with me in another capacity. We cannot be hypocritical. Now, now to be clear, I'm not talking about Jesus. Jesus had no sin, no error in what he did. I'm not, I'm just using this text, and I'm using this experience to teach us something because we have the tendency. We have the tendency. I can't stand this woman. I'm going to misuse her, abuse her, treat her illy, take advantage of her. But when it comes to me needing some money and some intimacy, she's going to be the first one I run to. I can't stand them folks over there. Don't like them, going to always speak evil about them. But when I get in their face, smile them. Beaming like the sun. All I'm saying is, just, okay, I said I wouldn't go. These are going to be quick. That's my, okay. Don't be hypocritical. When it comes to being honest about reconciliation, here, the Bible said the Jews had no dealings with Samaritans, and yet they, how are you going to not deal with them folk and buy their bread? How are you going to not deal with them folks and enter into this economic exchange? In the qualifier, I'm not talking about Jesus and the Jews and the disciples. I'm looking at that as how it applies to us. Jesus did it perfectly. We don't always do that. Let me leave that thing alone before I go down a rabbit trail. Point number two or thought number two or qualifier number two, don't be the catalyst. Don't be the catalyst. Take note of what the woman said here in the text. This is the way Holy Writ records it. 
the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Notice that she did not say the Jews and the Samaritans, you know what, they, they just don't get along. Notice she didn't say the Samaritans cannot stand the Jews. No, nope. what she said was the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Tammy ain't speaking to Miss Molly. Sunshine ain't got nothing to say to Dee Dee, Colton, Moon, and Mike Jackson. They ain't talking to Charles Bimbo. Do you see it? Do you see it? We need to be honest about our efforts that would hamper reconciliation. We cannot be the cause of the chaos. Look at here in scripture, the Jew, the religious folks, the religious folks, I'm not making it up. The Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. So if you and so-and-so haven't spoken for 10 years, ask yourself why? Is the distance warranted? Is it necessary for you to be at peace, for them to be at peace, for there not to be uh, any violence, anything? Is it on them where their sin, their disconnect is what's causing the disunity or, or? I feel like that man on the military thing, or is it you? And the third and final point, um, thought, don't be confused. My counsel from Jesus's experience is that we ought to be vulnerable. We ought to be transparent. We ought to be honest. We have to be willing to expose our weaknesses, thus highlighting our dependence on God for strength. I need you to hear me, so I'm going to say that again. We have to be willing to expose our weaknesses, thus highlighting our dependence on God for our strength. Do not miss this. Those two are inextricably tethered together. Let me read to you as I wrote it so I don't mess it up. If you fail to display your dependence on his strength in the midst of your weakness, and instead you're only pointing out the soft spots in your hard life, never celebrating your rest in his power, then you're not living the anointed life he has called for you to live. You'll be a whiner, a complainer. You'll feel sorry for yourself. You'll blame others. And your weakness will be your own and his power will not be. Did you hear that? Don't be confused because if you, if you don't hold those two things in tension, I just told you they are inextricably tied together. You exposing and confessing your weakness while Celebrating your dependence on God. If all you are just whine, whine, whine about your weakness, whine, whine, whine about your problem, never saying, but I'm trusting God, but he's got my back, but he's a deliverer, he's a strong tower, I'm holding on to his unchanging. If you don't do that, whiner, complainer, it's somebody else's fault. And you won't have his peculiar peace in the midst of your problem. You won't have his promised provisions when there's poverty and you'll lack his providential purpose when your life seems to not have a plan or path. Don't be confused. Confess our weaknesses, not be weak. My counsel is for us to be encouraged to confess our weaknesses, not be weak. Um, I think, I think I've labored long enough before you. And I think we'll stop there. And I'll share um, just a closing thought. This interesting thing about this woman of Samaria, there are gonna be some seasons. Remember my, my only point here is the Christians call for us to be vulnerable and transparent and honest. There are going to be some seasons in your life where you're going to have to work at it. You and I are going to have to work hard to say, you know what, I'm going to take this S off of my chest and, and I'm going to be human. I'm, I'm going to be 
Like, like my friends are not going to be able to dump their 30 gallons of trash into my 13 gallon uh, life. And, and, and don't hear this, don't hear this. And just say, oh, well, I can't call pastor and pastor CJ and I can't bother Lady Vaughn and Tammy because, you know, pastor CJ said, don't, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that, but at least give room, not just for us, but you too, to be able to say, you know what? My, my wife said something that, really made me think about this. And, and it really made me lean into this point a little more. She said we were having life group and she mentioned about a friend who she hadn't spoken to for years. A friend cut off a relationship because my wife said being married and having children and going through challenges in marriage. Now, I think she said, y'all probably muted it. It wasn't me, I wasn't, she wasn't going through anything with me. It was CJ that was giving her a headache and sunshine that was being the problem. It wasn't me, but she said, she spoke about how going through challenges in marriage caused this friend to be upset with her because she wouldn't stay on the phone hours and listen to her boyfriend talk and listen to stuff about work. And then my wife said, the friend just cut her off. So, so, so I heard my wife say that. And, and I, was, I, I was just thinking there ought to be a time where your friends, your co-workers, your, your, your brothers and sisters in Christ ought to just know, you know what, I'm going to share this part of my life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to walk this mile, but I'm going to accept the fact. I'm going to understand and appreciate the fact that, man, you got your own mess. You're going through your own problems. You, you experiencing COVID like we are. You are in the midst of this economic downturn just like we are. So don't hear me say this and then feel like you just want to pull back like I'm saying something that I'm not saying. Mostly you know that even if I make a mistake, I'm just going to say it anyway. I probably have to apologize later, but I, like, I'm not saying that. But at least recognize that um, like, like those shoulders are only so strong. Those muscles are only going to hold and carry so much. So be okay, number one, being transparent and being honest, but also be okay when honesty and transparency in someone else means that you may have to be strong for a moment. And I think I was going somewhere and I totally chased a rabbit, but one of the points I was making, and I'm going to wrap up with this, I promise. There are gonna be seasons where the transparency is going to be something you're gonna to have to work at. You're gonna to have to work to be transparent and honest. But then there are gonna be other seasons where your circumstances are gonna tell your story for you. Look at the woman at the well. Uh, she's by herself. It's in the middle of the day. No friends around. It's hot. And she's the one drawing water. I'm sorry, but you ain't got like Jesus long before he began to lay out stuff. Her story already said, mm, you got some problems in your life. So sometimes we are like the woman in the well, like trying to act like we got it all together. But most folks looking on just be like, no, I see you, man. Like, I see you. I saw you limp a long way off. So, hey, bring your thirst to the well that never runs dry. Bring your limp to the one who touched your thigh and caused you to limp. Bring your problems to the problem solver. Bring your broken heart to the heart fixer. Bring your issues to the one who says, lay that stuff on me because I care for you. And that's Jesus, the one who, when I tell you about confessing and exposing weakness, but not being weak, I had my wife to dig up this little clip before I said it because I hadn't seen the movie in a while, so I wanted to make sure I was right. Um, if you remember the scene in the movie, The Passion of the Christ, I'm talking about what it means to be vulnerable and look weak, but not be weak. Jesus was in the garden and he was, he was sweating and uh, appealing and crying out to God. And there was this Hasatan, this Satan figure. You, you know, it gets going, look at the clip. He, he, she looked very like sitting with covered up off in the shadows and was just kind of talking to Jesus. And Jesus was weak and crying and asking the father to remove the cup. And then all of a sudden the snake begins to slither out away from this Satan character. And Jesus, I saw it this morning. I hadn't noticed it years before. He gets up and he's been crying out and he's begging God to remove the cup and he's tired and sweating drops of blood. And he actually has to lean on a rock. He's so tired. 
looking weak. But then what did he do? Y'all know the movie. Y'all remember what he did? He raised up his heel and fulfilled scripture. Your heel will crush the head. He crushed and smashed Satan. So though he looked weak in that moment of weakness, he defeated and overcame death, Satan, flesh, the world, the grave, the cross, your sin, my sin, up on Golgotha Hill and declare upon his revival, all power, heaven and earth is in my hand. Pray with me, God, we've heard from your word, a call, a bold call. And if some of us are honest, it's an uncomfortable call to, to confess and admit weakness, to be honest and transparent about failings in our lives, to be, to be vulnerable about brokenness when yet I walk around in the world and declare that you've made me whole. If this is your teaching, if this is your word, if this was your word today, God, will you cause your people to lean into it? Say like Paul, I brag about my weaknesses. I'll be okay in insults and hardships. I'll be all right when things look bad because I know I serve a good God. I won't pick up sticks to cook a whole cake bread to die. Instead, I'll wait for the prophet to come and ask me to do something insane. I won't stand on the mountaintop and declare defeat. Instead, I'll ask you, God, to open my eyes and show me that we are victorious. I won't stand at the grave and believe death is the end. I believe in your word that says, because you live, I can live also. I will not walk around as a sinner. Being, being and embracing sin. But I war with Paul in Romans 7 and declare that I know the sin substitute. That you are the Lion of Judah. The lamb slain before the foundation of the world, no longer covering, but taking away my sin. If this is your word for your people, pierce it to their heart for your glory and our good. We ask it for Christ's sake. Amen.